from their call Giving worship to the Holy One On the faces they bow low In the cloud In the cloud Where the glory of the Lord fills the room
worship Him. Worship Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the King. Lift up your hands and your heart to Him this morning. God, we need you to move in a real way. God, we need you in a real way. Father, we need you in a real way. Uh, many of you met my friend Julia uh, Hines from Mississippi, who um, um, had just received a um, death sentence from the doctors. She had um, a cancer, a type of cancer that had wrapped itself around her lower spine. Uh, they told her that there was the longest she could live was seven years that uh, the only thing that they could do is go in by surgery and take out as much as they could of the cancer and then um, because there was no way to get it all because of the tentacles that would go out all over and wrap around the spine there was no way to get it all and uh, she got on the plane thank god she had learned to look to the master instead of listening just to the doctors she grabbed a plane Within four days, she had a plane ticket, and she was coming here. And she came here for the Bobby Connor conference. Amen. And we all prayed. We prayed individually, and then before she got on the plane going home that Sunday morning, the whole church gathered around her and prayed. When well, she went home, they did another ultrasound or another MRI, and they said that there was no new growth, and it had been growing so fast. There was no new growth. And even before she left, you could feel that it had gone down in her back. And they said, there's, there's fluid in here. And they didn't know what that was. Well, they took her to surgery at uh, MD Anderson in, in Texas and had two neurosurgeons, uh, nationally known here, neurosurgeons working on her. Um, she um, went into surgery with full confidence. And that morning, when Rodney and I prayed, just as the surgery was starting, we were here and we were praying. And when we finished praying, I asked Rodney, what did he see? And he said, I saw angels. There were more angels in that operating uh, room than there were people. And I said, well, I saw the angels too, but I also saw a hand on top of the surgeon's hand. And that hand took that surgeon's hand and he moved it over to the right. Well, every, her husband was sending us um, updates every time that they would send an update out and it was all as expected, as expected, as expected. And then suddenly <laughs> there was an unexpected that happened. <laughs> the two neurosurgeons walked out and they said, we don't understand. But that whole tumor came out in one piece. <laughs> there's, 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 no, there's no tumor left. And they said, on top of that, we don't, we don't get it. We don't know why. But as we, the surgeon that was doing the first incision, he says, as I started to make that first incision, he said, for some reason, I moved to the right. And when I did, we discovered two little tumors that had not shown up on the MRI. And if we had missed those, they would have grown and replaced this one that we're taking out. And he said, we got it all. And today, she's doing loops on her own feet. This woman who was supposed to be paralyzed, who was supposed to lose everything and die, she is making loops on her own feet around the nurse's station, and we give God the glory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I want to read this word. It's a prophetic word. I can't read the whole thing. It took too long when I read it to uh, Shirley, but I, I know of this guy, Tim Sheets, Dutch Sheets' his brother, and uh, I've been in contact with him, his wife and all. Uh, they lead up prayer movements around America, but anyway, he had a prophetic word. I'm going to read a few verses, a few, few paragraphs. He said, great revival fire will now begin to burn through intercession-soaked regions as my awakening begins to roll. The regions will now become activated by my glory. My shaking has come. I am shaking the earth. I am shaking heaven. Walls, strongholds, obstacles, and hell's defenses are being shaken down, and my remnant is being shaken free. My shaking will open ancient wells of revival. The revival in the womb of my intercessors will now be birthed. The revivalist mantle is descending upon my righteous evangelists. The fire shut up in their bones will now become words of fiery passion. With my gospel, I will shake open the cap wells of evangelism. I will shake open the ancient healing wells. Miracles will multiply. My angels are pumping those wells, and they are opening new wells, new roads, new inroads, new mantles, new vision, and a new harvest. Because your cries have come before me, because you have pursued my presence, says the Lord, because your worship has become sweet savor, the Lord of angel armies decrees over his remnant people, you shall now begin reality church. No more acting, no more actors, no more pretending. Real church, real disciples, real Christianity, real worship, real power, real glory, real miracles, real healing. It is ordained reality church. I am now coming to my remnant, and I am now coming as Lord Sabbath, Lord of angel armies. Because of alignment with my purposes, I will now align my host to assist aggressively. There is now a convergence of the angel armies and the church's prayer army into a divine coalition, the coalition of my willing, those who run to battle, not from it. My greatest campaign on earth is due. Decree it, says the Lord. Align your words with mine, and angel forces shall align with you. Align with angel forces in your regions, and I will accelerate an alignment within your nation. Yes, revival is now. The harvest is now, says the Lord. Victory is now, says the Lord. Arise and pursue my calls. Arise and roar. Arise and fight. Arise and shine. Your light has come, and the glory of God shines upon you. How many of you are in agreement with that? And we declare that, Lord. We decree with you that this is time. It's now. Now, I know God's been coming. It's been really, I thought here earlier in worship, I I thought, Lord, is there a condition where your heart can explode and you not die? You know, I was thinking about, I don't know, maybe in the spirit, but I felt like my heart was about to explode because of the times in which we're living. And I know that one characteristic of this move of God is there's not only going to be, you know, great enthusiasm, evangelism, worship. I appreciate JT calling us to go after God in worship. If you come around here and want to sit on your hands, I'm telling you, you're not going to be very comfortable. We want to pursue his presence. Go after God. God loves to be pursued. Those that have sat back and sat on the couch and say, God bless me if you want to are not going to walk in the things of God in this hour. you got to go after him. you got to embrace the kingdom. And the kingdom suffers violence, and great violence, and the violent take it by force. But we want to press on. And, um, but there's going to be the marriage of the Spirit and the marriage of the Word. we got to have instruction from the Word. And I've got something this morning, and uh, if it's a title, it's called Understanding Times and Seasons, but Living with Eternity in Our Hearts. It's going to be vital that you don't look at just what's happening around you. It's going to get worse. Can I just, just agree with everybody? Is that okay? Darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the glory of the Lord shall arise upon you. And kings are literally going to come to the earth. You're arising. And uh, that word last week that uh, Lance had, he just showed up. Lance Walnow just showed up here. That heads of state would come. And so, Lord, bring them on. And it doesn't matter from the, the lowest to the highest. It's the time that we've been waiting for. 
So, Lord, we thank you, and we ask you to open our eyes and give us understanding to the Word, Lord, to the instructions that only you can give. God, we don't want to just um, be here. We want to be with you. And we ask, God, that we hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour. And I thank you for reminding me of the dream that I had early this morning about how that I was getting ready and you were confirming that it's the oracles of God. When you preach, preach as if it's the oracles of God. And, Lord, we believe that. And we bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to go with me, if you would, to Ecclesiastes and uh, chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and you remember this. I think they, well, I know they did. There's been songs about it. And, uh, but it's, it has something for us today that's very critical that we understand and all that's going on around us. And if you think you've heard the worst of it, hang on. Because there are things going to happen that will shock men's ears. In fact, Jesus said there's going to be times men's hearts are literally going to fail them from fear of the things that are coming upon the earth. But not the church. The church is not. Their heart, our heart is not to fail us from fear. In fact, it's going to cause us to become even more bold. Now, look at this. To everything, verse 1, there is a season. Say everything. 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 There is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Now, the word time is the Hebrew word duration or the length of, of of a period of time. The word season means an appointed occasion. And there are those, you know, duration of time. There's also those appointed occasions. I'm still reading. I just got started this book called The Shemitah. Shirley's way ahead of me. She's always ahead of me. But you'll read that book, and it is incredible how God has moved in seven-year intervals. And this is the seventh year, the Sabbath year, and how those nations that have honored God have received great blessing during this year coming up. But those nations that have forsaken God, the judgments were poured out on those lands. And you can see through history, through the, he talks about the very day, the very hour, and even the very minute that things have happened. Let me tell you, God is a God of order. He's a God of time. And there's seasons, there's times that God is moving, things that he's doing in response to how men have reacted to him and responded to him. Now, let's go on and read the rest of that. He says, there's a time for every purpose under heaven or on the earth, a time to be born and there's a time to die. Now, God's in both of them, and this is the the emphasis. There's a time for this, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh. Aren't you glad that you get times to laugh, especially after weeping? Weeping may endure for the night, but the joy of the Lord will come in the morning. There's a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to stop embracing. You understand that? A time to gain, and there's a time to lose. It's part of life. A time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and there's a time to speak up. We we could learn lessons in both of those, right? There's a time to shut your mouth, but there's a time to speak up, and this is one of those times in our nation. A time to love and a time to hate. What could you hate? Well, hate the things that God hates. And uh, the Scriptures talk about that. I think it's uh, Proverbs. A righteous man hates lying. That's one thing we can hate. And there's a time of war and a time of peace. Now, in all these things, there's, there's a season. This week I read Oswald Chambers. I still read Oswald. I like I don't care how many times I've read it. I still like it. Jesus Christ, here's what he said. Jesus demands that his disciple does not allow even the slightest trace of resentment in his heart when faced with tyranny and injustice. In other words, when life throws you a curveball or when your world, as you know it, falls apart, God's intention is that we not become resentful or bitter or angry are, are fearful, but that we become more resolute in our passion and our purpose to follow the Lamb of glory, that we be more determined than we've ever been in our life, that we're going to trust Him and believe in Him. 
Because everything is going to be shaken. I really like what Tim Sheets said. You know, part of the reason to shaking is to shake us from these things in the world. Get them off of us so that we'll let them go. The one thing that will remain, it will not end, is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that revelation of who he is, we want the revelation. We don't want to just hear the word. We want to see him. And then we want to know him. Now, I want to go from there. We'll come back later and end up at that because I think there's some things that we can see from it. But just remind you of what uh, the Lord promised us, this congregation. If you just showed up, you get to walk in this inheritance. Is that okay? Say, I get to walk in it. One of them is revival. I'm telling you, it's been in my heart since I was a little kid, and I'm not going to let it go. I believe we're going to see the greatest awakening to touch this nation, even in the midst. It's probably going to be at the same time. But God is going to have a word to our nation. And we're a part of it. We're going to see. I'm t- I, w- I drove up this morning. I thought, you know, one day people that get here late will not get in. They will not have a seat. They'll have to wait for something else because God's going to bring them. But anyway, I'm just speaking out of my heart. Can I do that? You love me anyway. And uh, I get a little excited. I'm supposed to get it. What if I was boring and dull? You look at the mirror. Boy, you're boring and dull. And get rid of that stuff. There's a fire burning inside of us. It's the Holy Spirit. He's burning. Listen, if your fire's out, you need to go get refired. Because that fire that's coming on the earth will either consume you or burn you up. One or the other. You're going to be burned up or you're going to be set ablaze. You think I'm joking? The spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. You can read it in Isaiah. You'll either be devoured by this or you'll be consumed and set on fire for the world to see why you're burning. But anyway, part of the inheritance is to add to be as the sons of Issachar. Lord promised this group, we will be as the sons of Issachar. So look with me in 2 Chronicles and chapter 12 and verse 32. And uh, this is very familiar. You remember, we've spoken about it, but I want to just review something about what these guys were up to and what was happening in the context. And uh, then we'll go back to Ecclesiastes and glean from the wisdom of King Solomon. We're going to need wisdom today. How many of you know that? We don't know what to do. God, this is, we've never been here before in the days that we're living. And um, this is what he wants to do. So let's look at this in verse 32. The sons of Issachar who had understanding of the time. Say they had understanding. Proverbs 24, verse 3 says, Through wisdom a house is built, but by understanding it is established. Say established. We don't want to just build. We want to be established. The the Hebrew word means to be properly, to be uh, erect, to stand perpendicular, to be set up, fixed, prepared, rendered sure, and prosperous. That's what it means to be established. Now, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. The only church of where that's going to be true is those that are established in his word, established in faith, established in walking in the spirit, in understanding the principles of the kingdom. They're walking with him. And uh, how many of you saw Rick's second word this week? A follow-up from his first word that he saw. He said he went into greater detail this week. If you hadn't seen that, you need to watch this urgent warning that God had shown him in this dream. But he sec- that secondly, he said that coming across the borders of America, he saw these ancient civilizations with these ancient deities that have been evidently released out of the abyss, released out of the gates of hell. And there are going to be things happen in America we would never have dreamed have happened before. And he saw them coming in. And yet we got to be reminded that Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We're going to find out those who were playing church and those who really were the church in this hour. The gates of hell will prevail against everything that's pretentious and make-believe. Everything. I can tell you it's going to happen. But they won't against those who are built on that revelation. And, you know, Jesus said, who do men say that I am? 
You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. If that's your testimony and flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but the living God, then you're standing on solid foundation. It's the only foundation that won't be shaken in this hour. So they had understanding. But not only understanding, they knew what they ought to do. God, what are we supposed to do? You know what I'm talking about. I mean, we're asking for wisdom. Daniel 12, 10, referring to the end of the age, he said, but the wicked shall do wickedly. That means increasing and extreme. How many of you would agree there's extreme wickedness today in the land? And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, to have understanding, you have to have light. I want to go back to a a dream that I had back in the warehouse when we were meeting back in the old days. Seemed like a long time ago now. Whole new congregation. It's been ordered by the Lord, but, but I remember I had a dream, and I was in a western town. And I knew it was western because you could see the rails where they park. Well, I don't know if you park horses or not. You tie them up. But anyway, I could see the boarded walkways, and, uh, you know, just, just take my word for it. It was a western town. And I was looking for Hulse, you know. I, I knew where I was. But all of a sudden, the lights went out. I don't know what lights they had in, in that western town, but everything went out. It was pitch black. It wasn't totally black because I could see people had tried to get back to their homes. So they, they were fallen in the streets and laying up against their door, and I believe they were dead. And I believe the word was they have no hope. They've lost hope. When the lights went out, they lost hope. And I went in my house And Shirley and I and the kids were there. Y'all were there too, okay? We were sitting around a table, and we had a candle in the middle of that table. And I sat down with them, and I knew the moment I sat down, if we had light, we had hope. And I knew we were going to make it. There was something in me that said, this is not as bad as what you think it is. You've got hope. And if you have light, you're going to have hope. You know, Jesus said, you know, those that follow me, shall not walk in darkness, but they shall have the light of life. Just say that. Say, I've got the light of life. I'm not going to walk in darkness. You follow him. He's the light of the world. And you'll not walk in darkness. I I saw where the prime minister of, was it Australia, where they, you know, they found, discovered this, they were going to do these beheadings, and they intercepted uh, this plot And he called it these darkening times. And it is a dark time. But if you're looking above the darkness, you'll see there's a a sun that's arising, and it's the Son of God, and he is coming. He's coming with great authority and great fire in the midst of his people. 1 John 1, 5 through 7 that said, This is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Say, no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we are liars and we do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another. Fellowship with one another. Koinonia and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If you're not connected and in fellowship and in koinonia, I'm telling you, your light's about to go out. We're going to need one another like we've never needed one another before. The Lord's word is going to be settled. It already is settled. He prayed that we would be one, and we will be. I'll never forget here we were in Cuba, and I think I get to go back in December, Lord willing, praying about that. I've been invited. Last time was incredible, many years ago. But uh, someone asked the pastor there, he said, how come there's so much unity among the denominations in Cuba? He said, well, it's a very simple thing. He said, when you've spent time behind bars with a pastor down the street, believe me, you're not that concerned about those pet disagreements. You're just seeking after that one thing that binds us together. And so there was understanding, but also we knew what to do. We're going to know what to do, guys, because we know the one who knows what to do. I'll talk more about it. And then thirdly, in the context, there was a time of war. They were in a time of war. How do you know that? Well, verse 33, it says, they, these are the other, all these sons 
of Israel and, and such as Zebulun, they went out to battle, expert in war, with all weapons of war. And then in down in 36, those who could go out to war. And verse 38, all the men of war. Verse 37, every kind of weapon of war. And it speaks, you know, the, the natural speaks to the spirit, the spiritual wars. How many of you know it's going on right now? And there are going to be wars and rumors of wars. But see that your heart is not troubled. Now, there's something about being on the defensive versus being on the offensive. I don't mean be offensive, but you will be offensive if you're walking in the truth. Come on up here, Shirley. She had a dream this week, and I wanted her to, to share that with you because when my wife gets dreams, I listen. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, <clears throat> I was just in the process of waking up, and that's usually when I have these type of dreams. And in my dream, I saw um, that I, I could see myself sleeping in the bed, and I was standing at the head of the bed looking that way at myself. And there were two demons that came to me, and they were, you know, irritating and doing their thing that they do. Um, one was black and one was red. And I, I took authority over them in the name of Jesus, and they disappeared which is what you expect. Only these demons were just playing with me and they'd come right back. And so finally, I, I think just something rose up within me, a, a greater confidence. I wasn't at all afraid, which was pretty amazing. And what I ended up doing is when they came back, I grabbed hold of the black one's arm and I pulled it down to me because it was trying to just disappear again so it could come back in a moment and bother me some more. And I wouldn't let it do that. And so I pulled it down by its arm and I put my hand on its head and began to tell it exactly what its future destiny was going to be. And oh, that's pretty wild to do, isn't it? And, and I was pronouncing the future judgments that are written in the Bible, in Revelation and other places. And did it in the name of Jesus. And at that point in time, I could see that it had fear. And it went away for good that time. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, you remember Psalm 149. Hey, David, you have Psalm 149 up there. The, there's some verses. Did I give you that? Yeah, there it is. The, let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. God's word. To execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples to bind their kings, those who are in authority, spiritual principles, with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them. Who? The rulers and authorities, the powers, the written judgment. Say the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. That's your honor. It's part of what you've been called to do. Now, I know I was thinking about that. We, were, we shared that Wednesday, and uh, we went out, and Keith uh, Rutledge, she said, you know, that sounds like the two horses, the red horse and the black horse. And I believe it has a lot to do with that. The, do you remember what the red horse was of the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse? They were sent to take peace from the earth, and there was to be war. And then the black horse, do you remember what that was? It was famine. It says, he who sat on the black horse had a pair of scales in his hand, and then there was a loud voice that said, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarters quarts of ba or barley for a denarius. Now, someone has said the church has been in a war that most have not shown up for. I want you to know if you don't show up for this one, this is what you were made for. And this is one where if you show up, you're going to find that he's the one who will win the battle for you. He's already spoiled principalities and powers. And I believe we had a word earlier. We've got to walk in that authority. We've got to grab this stuff and execute on them the written judgment. And God has given us an authority. And then the next thing is, well, let me just point this out. Those Marines... That was pretty encouraging. They knew their authority. Hoorah! They were ready. And they were shouting that song. Though these are days of great trial and famine and darkness and sword, these are the days of Elijah, and we will rise up. God's, there will be a voice in the desert crying, prepare the day of the Lord. If God can do that with the United States Marines, he can do it with the church of Jesus Christ. 
And then they were in battle formation. You look at this, and they could keep ranks. Lo and behold, they were in ranks. They weren't stragglers on their own. They were in ranks. It's the only way God does things. And His Word will endure forever. They were in battle formation. The church is being prepared right now in position. Lance told us last week, he said, you remember Rick's book, Epic Epic Battles of the Last Days? He said, that's right now, guys. This is not next year. In fact, this is the Sabbath year. This is the year you're going to see great blessing or great judgment. And it's all there. It's just God is such a God of order and a God of time. But it's not a day to be AWOL. It's the day that all creation is waited for. And he's looking. Right now they're looking for the revealing of the sons of God. And our part is to show up every day and do it. You know, it's interesting that uh, just prior to Psalm 110, it says, Your people shall volunteer in the day of your power. Remember that? Right before that, it says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And you just consider that. It takes the body that's all fit together under the head where the next step will be under our footstool. And that's the only way it's going to happen. It's a picture of the last day church. The enemies are placed under the footstool, under the head of the Lord Jesus. And then they had singleness of mind and purpose. Where's that? Look in verse 38. All these men of war who could keep ranks came to Hebron with a loyal heart to make David king. And they were of one mind to make David their king. So who's our David? Jesus is our David in the lineage of David. And the greatest purpose, the greatest cause on the earth is to do the bidding of the king in this hour. That's what those young people in Berkeley and uh, Chris that we met who came and spent a month out here. And that's what our young people are looking for today. Show me a cause and I'll sign up. And it's not the cause of religion. It's the greatest cause. It's the cause of Jesus Christ. And he's looking for those that will walk with him with a loyal heart because his kingdom is the only kingdom that's going to last, going to endure. And then they had, now this is when it gets good. They had abundant provision. Now look in verse 40. Moreover, those who were near to them from as far away as Issachar and Zebulun and Naphtali were bringing food on donkeys and camels, on mules and oxen, provisions of flour and cakes of figs, cakes of raisins, wine and oil and oxen, and sheep abundantly. Say abundantly. And then we'll read the rest in just a moment. Now, as your pastor, I would encourage you, even for a rainy day, you ought to have food to survive for a few months at least. You ought to have access to water. You should have already scouted that out. You can't live but just, what, three days without water or less, something like that. You can live a longer. Hey, God may force us into a fast. And it may be, you know, I don't know what all is going to happen, but I'm telling you, you should have a little stored up. Now, some people say, well, that's just fear. My God's going to supply me. Let me give you an example. Let's just think back. Matthew 6.33 says, take no thought what you're going to eat or drink, what you're going to put on. But we know the context, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Okay, say you take no thought. It's 10 degrees outside, and you wake up one morning, you say, look, if God wanted to clothe me, he'd clothe me. I, I'm just not going to be cold today. I'm not, I refuse that. I'm going out buck naked. I know it's 10 degrees, but if God wanted me to have clothes, he'd have them. He promised me in, in Matthew chapter 6. And you go out, what's going to happen to you? That, as you study that in context, he's talking about seeking the kingdom above all things. And when you're seeking the kingdom, God will raise up opportunity for you to find the provision you need. The sacrifice, God will make a lamb. He he did make the lamb, but he'll also, he said he's concerned about all of these things. Don't worry about them. You don't worry. We're not called to worry But we're called to be prepared. That's part of being established. And if you're not prepared for a few months, guys, there are so many things that could happen. Now, if you want to live that way, but I'm telling you, Jesus took the few loaves and the fishes. He found something that existed where men could identify with, and then he took it and blessed it, multiplied it, and fed the multitudes. You're never going to have enough to survive what's coming. You'll never have enough. 
all of your plans will come fall short. If what happens, if what the prophets are hearing and what God's Word says, you're never going to have enough. But let me tell you, if you just walk in obedience and faith and confidence, you resolve in Him, you seek His kingdom first, you're going to find all these things will be added unto you. It's one way or the other. I don't know how it's going to happen. Probably not by you just laying there and saying, oh, God, if you want me to eat, feed me. You may have to go out and work a little bit. You may have to find something. But our God is faithful. He looks for people that believe in him. Faith is not sitting back. Faith is walking up, trusting God, stepping out where you've never stepped out before. So I'm just encouraging you. you if you don't do it, you know, I, can, I was thinking about the, the ten virgins, you know, five of them. We ain't going to get, hey, listen. We run out of oil. Our God will supply our oil. They were foolish. And they ran out and they went and knocked on the door, you give us some of yours. And they didn't get it. I don't know how that's going to work. You ought to save enough for you and your neighbors because your neighbors aren't saving. You say, well, I'll run out faster. Two things. You get to go to glory quicker or you'll be in a position to see the supernatural. We're going to see the dead raised on this property. It's been prophesied here. We're going to see blind eyes open. And God's going to provide. He's going to multiply the bread and fishes for the multitude to those that believe him. And if you believe him, if you're not believing him now, you won't believe him then. You're faithful in little things. You'll be faithful in big things. So anyway, I'm just saying. That's just my advice. How many months? Ask God. He'll tell you. Proverbs says, one of the things on the earth that is little on the earth but is exceedingly wise, the ant... They per, they're a people not strong, but they prepare their food in the summer. Why? Because winter's coming. All right. Now look in verse 40. All of you, I got your attention. Some of you say, ah, oh, it's just unbelief. I'm going to believe God. Well, maybe you have that kind of faith. Maybe you do. We all better because what we have is not going to work. But what he has lasts for eternity. Boy, it's going to be, we're going to be confident in him. It's going to grow. You think you've been, you think you know your God? How good your God is? Let me tell you, church, we're going to know how good our God is. Worship won't be something you have to work up. Worship is something you'll just, your heart will explode because of his goodness. You can't but help worship him. Worship won't be anything that anyone has to go to. They get to go to. It's their lifestyle. They live to worship him. And it's going to be, and then in verse 40, at the end of that, for there was joy in Israel. Say there was joy. joy. Great joy in all of this, in war. There was great joy because they knew their God. And, and he that had begun a good work, they knew he would complete it. Now, let me just read this. First Peter, we're going to go back to Ecclesiastes and wrap it up. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice. Say greatly rejoice. Are you ready? You ready to greatly rejoice? Though now for a little while, say a little while, if need be, you've been grieved with various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by the fire. Say, tested by the fire. May be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation, the revealing, the times that we're living in right now of Jesus Christ, whom you've not seen, you love, though now you do not see him. You ever been in that time where you said, God, where are you? God, where are you? Yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. That's heaven's joy. That word, you got to live, you got to live on the earth as in heaven. Let me tell you, it is not only a probability or a possibility, it is supposed to be ability. I don't know if that's a word, but God said we're going to live in heaven on earth. We are dual citizens. And our citizenship actually is not in this world. We're just passing through. We're citizens of a kingdom, a different kingdom. And the receiving, the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We ought to just pray for the release of that joy. I could use some of that now, couldn't you? I thought, well, God, what if I do that? I won't be able to finish. 
Let's just ask the Lord. I'll finish if it's the Lord's will. It's just the next few points go fast. They're like five minutes. Lord, we need joy. God, thank you. Joy is not of us. It's of you. The joy of not men and women, the, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And God, it seems like one of those psalms, we're going to be able to convert sinners when, when there's joy in us, when the joy of our salvation, you know what I'm talking about, it, that's there, the joy of our salvation, then we'll convert sinners from their way. So, Lord, we ask you to release joy. We've got to have joy. Holy Spirit, come. Release joy to your people. Heaven's joy, inexpressible, full of glory, unspeakable joy. We ask you to release it in our hearts, in our families, in our children. Break out, Lord. Break out, Holy Spirit. Lord, we give you permission to break it out in the middle of Walmart. How many of you are willing vessels? I say, I'm willing. I'm a willing vessel. Lord, we ask you to break out at the stoplights in joy. We pray for joy. God, we got to have you now in America. We cannot wait another year. We ask for the joy of the Lord, the joy, the joy of our Jesus. Joy, receive it. I receive it. Some of you say, I'm not worthy. None of us are worthy. It's the blood of Jesus that makes us worthy. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Now, Lord, I'm asking, I'm believing. If it hadn't broken out here like it ought to, break out when we go home. Break out in the supermarkets. Break out, God, in the highways and byways. How else is your house going to be full unless they see joy that they've never seen before? And that's your will. You said, go out into the highways and byways. That my house would be full. And there were those you gave up on. But there were those you gathered in as a day, a last day remnant. And God, we ask you to do it in our day. Send your joy. Send your fire. Lord, we want, your, we want to be marked. I pray over every person. I mark them right now. There's uh, the angel of the Lord. He, I know we've done this, but I see him doing it again. He's marking you on your forehead as a child of God. And the, the only way people are going to know you is because of the presence of God in your life. You won't feel a thing at times, but God's marking you for the hour with an inkhorn. He's marking you. God, spill it out. Spill it out in Jesus' name. Okay, let's go back to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. and I'm going to wrap it up, but there's just some things I wanted to show you. Now, looking at this list, it's almost as if there's a positive and then a negative or vice versa. I think he switches them in, in this list. From times there's a negative and a positive, but, but it looks like it. Now, how many of you know it takes a negative and a positive charge for electricity? There's just something in there. I'm not, I'm not that versed on all that. All I know is you go flip the switch and it comes on. That's all I needed to know, but there are those who know much more and about the, the atom and consist of positively charged nucleus, and then it's surrounded by a cloud of negativity cloud of negative charged electrons. I thought, God, that is prophetic. That's amazing. He's a God. There's the goodness of God and the severity of God. And there are those who thought, well, that's a negative. And they don't know that God is the God of both. He's a God living and dying, mourning and laughing. I mean, he's just a God. He's God. I'm going to show you that. And we need both. We need the wisdom of Solomon. Now, Here's, here's what we can see. Verse 11, he's made everything. Say everything. everything. Seemed like I heard a commercial where they said, what is that? It's everything. Everything. I like that. Well, I tell you, it's everything. God's made everything. Two scriptures. Revelation. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. You created what? Everything are all things. Uh-oh, God, you create all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Colossians 1, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created. Say all things were created. 
that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And then the next thing, everything that he made was beautiful in its time. Remember Ray Stevens, was it? I looked it up. Everything is beautiful. That'll tell you how old you are. In its own time, in its own season. And I tell you, God can come in the greatest tragedy in all this list. It doesn't matter what's happening. God can show up and use that which the enemy has intended for evil. Because all things work together for good to them that love him. And are called according to his purpose. And those that are called and those that love him, you're going to know it. They're going to have more confidence in God when the world is breaking apart because they're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Now, this is an amazing scripture. We read it last week, Ecclesiastes 7.13. I don't know if I gave this to David, but listen to it. It says, consider the work of God. Whatever you can think about that whole list in Ecclesiastes. Consider the work of God for who can make straight what he has made crooked. Or in other words, who can make crooked what he's made straight? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. How many of you would be joyful? But in the day of adversity, consider this. Surely God has appointed the one alongside the other. For every purpose, appointed occasion and time, there's a season. There's a purchase, a purpose under heaven. And the key is time. And then in verse 11, verse B, it, at the end of that, he's put eternity in their heart. Eternity. There's something about being able to look beyond the here and now and seeing the, the then and thou or whatever. But I'm telling you, looking beyond. He put eternity in their hearts. That's how they made it. And that's how we'll make it. It's not by what we see. It's, it's by whom we believe and we've entrusted. We may not know what the future holds, but we know who holds our future. We may be here a day or we may be here another 25 or 50 years, but we know that God is with us. And eternity plants it in us. We're in the world, but we're not of it. What else could cause Stephen in the midst of stoning to lift up his eyes instead of duck what was coming at him? And he saw the, the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father. He saw the glory of God. He was a citizen of that kingdom. And he had eternity in his heart. And I'm going to pray that. Lord, I ask you to put eternity in our hearts. God, let us be a, a people stamped with eternity. Because even if we die, yet shall we live if we believe in you. Death is not the end of a saint. It's the beginning of a glorious inheritance. And God, we say yes and amen to you. And then the next thing in verse 14 it says uh, that I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Say forever. forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken away. God does it that men should fear before him. And that is that he's eternal. That what God begins, he will complete. And the greatest work that he completed was with his son when he said, it is finished. And he lived a sinless life, and then he gave it all up, didn't he? He said, I'm sacrificing it all, guys. I love you so much. There's no greater love than this, than one would lay his life down. And he that deserved to live in eternity and not suffer the cross gave it up so that you and I could live free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You'll never be in yoked. If you know and follow him. And um, that's what I know. The cross, man, it's the cross. I remember years ago, first vision I ever had when I was way before I was Rick's ministry assistant. I think, it, well, obviously, it was the first conference that I went to at Morningstar. And I saw the cross, gigantic cross. And it was on fire, burning. Then the second scene, it was dripping wet. Water was dripping off of it. Then the third scene, it was set ablaze again, and this time it was engulfed with flames. And I asked the Lord, and I believe he said, he said the, the church was 
birthed with the fiery preaching of the cross. And then something happened, and he got watered down. Men watered down my message of the cross. But he said, at the end of the age, I'm going to reignite that message, and it will blaze brighter than it ever has in the history of all the earth. And men will run to that cross because that's the hope. It's the hope. His resurrection offers the greatest hope, and that's a hope that's eternal. And, God, I thank you so much. For what you're doing in this hour, God, I thank you for everyone that you brought here this morning. And I ask you, God, to bring those that were ordained to be here. And and I trust you, Lord. I ask you to sound the alarm and blow a trumpet. And, Lord, I thank you that there are many listening to that sound in this hour. All over this nation. They're all alone, many of them, but they're listening. They're hearing the sound of a trumpet. And, God, I just pray you'll encourage them, strengthen them, build them up, Lord. And, and God, visit every one of them, Lord, afresh and anew, walk in to where they are. But, Lord, we ask you right now over the web stream, God, there are people in nations, and and they wonder how they're going to make it. And they see Ebola, and they see radical terrorism on the march, on the move. And God, I thank you for those geographical places of refuge. But I believe you, God. You said that everyone that makes you their refuge, they are in a place of refuge. Because it's beyond the geographical lines. Lord, I pray for those nations. I pray for those in Sierra Leone and those in Liberia and Ghana and those various places. Lord, we pray for Australia. We pray for Great Britain. We pray for the believers in Iraq and Syria. God, we ask, Lord, for your presence, that the presence of God would overshadow the darkness that's arising. God, we ask for a great witness in this hour in the Middle East that our God reigns, that men might know that there's a God in Israel. There's a God over your people. And, Lord, I pray for everyone in this room that, God, you would set their heart on fire. Lord, I ask, Lord, it is possible. Lord, let our hearts burst without dying. God, let us burst. Let us burst for you. God, if there's anyone lost, God, I thank you. This is the day that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be delivered, shall be healed. And, God, we pray right now for those that are lost that this would be the day of salvation, those that are watching. And in this room and wherever, you call on him. Let me tell you, he's not very hard to find. If the Holy Spirit is drawing you, that's a divine conviction. You can't go to him when you want to. You call upon him while he's near, and he'll not disappoint you. And you say, Jesus, save me. Forgive me. I'm a sinner, but you died for me. And I say yes to you. Thank you for the cross and for your resurrection. And then, God, I pray for supernatural wisdom that, Lord, everyone in this room would be established, prepared, standing erect, set in place. God, whatever that means. God, we don't have the wisdom. You said if any man lacks, let him ask of me. And you said you would give to all men without reproach, liberally. You're a liberal God in that way. And we ask you to release liberally wisdom for this hour to know what we ought to do. God, I thank you for understanding, but we thank you that we'll know what we ought to do. Even in the times of great conflict and even in the midst of the running of the horses, thank you that we have the greater authority, that our God reigns and we're walking in it. And, Lord, I ask you to release it now in every man, woman, boy, girl, everyone. There's an anointing here. You ain't going out until God fills you up with what I, I feel like he wants to give you, all right? God, fill them up. Fill them up. What if it was the last time we ever saw each other in this building? I, I don't know all that's going to happen. I believe we're going to keep going, and there's going to be revival, and multitudes are coming. Heads of state are coming. I believe all that. But, Lord, these are people, God, they got to have you every day. We want you Monday morning. Lord, we want you. We want your presence. We want you to mark our children for Jesus. Mark our lives as soldiers of the cross. God, set everybody on fire. 
You're the fire. We can't drum this up ourselves. We ask for the fire of the Holy Ghost to burn in us. Lord, our nation, we know we're definitely not the only. We're just one part. God, there are fires all over this nation. Now let the wind of God blow, Lord. Stir the fires. Stir the fires, God. In Ohio, just pray for the state that you were born in or, or where, you were, where you grew up. Just lift up that state to the Lord. Lord, fan the flames in Pennsylvania and Louisiana. Fan the flame in Mississippi, oh God. The churches along the Gulf Coast. God, send a great revival along the Gulf Coast of our nation. Houston, Texas, oh God. Father, let a great testimony that you're the great one in Texas, God. Lord, we ask you to pour out your spirit. Pray for Nevada right now. Nevada, God, Las Vegas, it has a reputation of one thing. Let them have a reputation of a God thing. In the name of Jesus Christ, God, pour out your spirit. California, Lord, Berkeley, next, the fourth, God, God, let there be a visible display of the glory of God when those students show up at the call, Berkeley. And Lord, shake the University of Berkeley because of the students that are on fire for God. Oh, God, just keep interceding. You've got to show you. Pray. Let's just intercede. Pray. JT had a word. It's intercession. Worship. He said, my house will be called a house of prayer. If we're a house of prayer, we're right in line with what he called us to be. God, we pray. Oh, God, we got folks that live down in Bermuda. Let's pray for Bermuda. God, start a revival in Bermuda, God. Set the waves of the Holy Spirit there. Oh, God, let a hurricane of your glory sweep over Bermuda. In the name of Jesus, we prophesy healings across America. Healings. We speak to cancers. If you know somebody with cancer, lift up their name right now. If Jesus can heal this lady, God, we ask you right now, right now we speak to cancer and we pull it close to us and we lay our hand and we, st- we set it on that, whatever that cancer is, and we, we say we execute the written judgment. You've been defeated at the cross. The blood of Jesus, Jesus made a public display of you. He spoiled your power and authority. Loose our loved ones in the name of Jesus. We break the spirit of cancer. And we bind up Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. God, we ask you, let there be testimonies. I just see, let the St. Louis Post and Dispatch write a report on how those in that region were healed of Alzheimer's, we pray, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God. And Lord, thank you these guys love me, and if they think I'm crazy, they love me anyway. But, Lord, there are a bunch of peculiar people here, too. We're a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Listen, don't you sell yourself short. Don't you dare slight the sacrifice. Don't let the lamb lose the reward of his suffering. For you, thank you, God. And I don't know what to do next, but I think there are going to be prophetic teams over there. And um, why don't you come up? We will pray. Come on up here. We want to pray for people around the altar, okay? Dylan, you good? Me and Dylan went and visited a homeless guy. When was it? A couple days ago. I brought him that food. We're going to just keep going and praying for him because his mind's all messed up. He, man, he's been through hell. What do you expect? You know what I mean? And, but, uh, oh, there's a girl in Canada. The Fletchers were telling me I heard about her. Her name's Rachel. Lord, touch Rachel in Canada. She's in a ministry, a dance ministry there, but, Lord, we ask for a miracle for Rachel. And that little four-year-old boy we saw on Fox, Chad from Michigan. Lord, touch Chad, four years old. They reported on him on Fox. What a great opportunity for a miracle. We pray, heal that four-year-old boy. Take out the tumors, God. We break the power of that uh, judgment against that little boy. And we ask that they have a follow-up report on what God did for little Chad. Lord Jesus, you're a healing Jesus. He's a healer. We want to pray for healing this morning, so we're just going to go ahead and break up. And if you need healing, you need prayer, come up. And 
If you don't know Jesus, there's a bunch of saints around you. Just say, man, pray for me. I want to know that I know that I know this guy. I want to know him, and uh, we'll pray for you. But God bless you guys. Put in, how about number four? Put in number four on that CD. That's a good one. And um, God bless you. Hey, we have some visitors from Texas, great state of Texas, Dallas. Hey, bless those guys. Lord, don't forget Dallas. Dallas, Fort Worth area, Euless, and all those little towns in between the Metroplex there. God, pour out your spirit there. Thank you. God bless you guys. Have a great day. We're here to pray for you.